knows about your work work mice is the lady who got us my Taha got you into joining us thanks to mice Taha but most importantly also I'd like to thank the American University of Maraba for hosting this session I would like to send the regards of the president he called me about two hours ago he said Moon Akru he just been appointed as a president and he said he sends his best regards. I wish you good luck, my friend. And the floor is you. Aya, thank you for joining us to monitor this session. Fida, it's a pleasure always to have you. We launch this as the first of our season because we have a new dean, so that's it. Secondly, I'd like to congratulate Richard. Tomorrow is his birthday. God bless you. And many, many, many more years to come. It is a pleasure always to stand front in front of a guy who is a mentor, one of Giulio Ponti students in Italy. When you stand and you listen to Richard England, I think it's always a pleasure to hear an encyclopedia, an on ongoing encyclopedia of architectural design, drafting, poetry, philosophy, historian, and this is what I call, what we are missing now, a renaissance people in architecture. Please, the floor is yours, guys. Nice? Yes, thank you, sir. Kamel, that was embarrassing. <laughs> far, far too much. Merhaba, merhaba. Marhabte. For me, the fact that I'm in touch with Jordan, again, is a great asset. I love Jordan for two reasons. One, because I think you house one of the most amazing places in the world, the rock-hewn city of the Nabataeans, Petra. I can never forget my visits with Kamel to that extraordinary place. The other reason I love Jordan is, of course, Kamel. Kamel, to me, is one of the great artistic landscape architects, but he is probably, and I say this with great honesty, one of the greatest delineators I have ever come across. He has a magic wand in his hand. Thank you, Kamel, for your friendship and God bless you. Now we know I needed some help because when you get to my age, you see, you, I belong to an age when apples and blackberries were fruits and the mouse was a rodent with a long tail. So when I come to this internet technology, I am a little bit lost. So I've got architect mice who has very kindly helped me out with all these and brought me into the 21st century, because at our age, you know, there's nothing to do. We have birthdays. But whilst I cannot stop growing old, I can stop myself growing up. And I think that is one of the most important things, to try and preserve something of the child within you. Michael Ende, who wrote The Never-Ending Story, says, man dies when the last part of the child in him becomes an adult. So I will go on and try desperately to preserve the humor, the childlike innocence, which is so necessary today in this world, which I'm afraid seems to have gone a little bit onto the wrong side of the fence. Now, I think we need to address a little bit something to students. You are the future. Our generation have done the world in. You know, we will get to the stage where when the last tree gives us no fruit and the last piece of soil goes barren, our generation will find out that we cannot eat our money. So the task of treading gently on this planet, and we need to tread gently on this planet, Architects need to think more of 
eco as opposed to ego. Architects tend to be pretty egoistic, architectural, self-centered people. We need to get the images. And now I think we need to start off with some definitions. Definitions initially of architecture. Architecture, I think it was Philip Johnson who had a quite a biting tongue had said that it's not very different from the oldest profession because it is to act to give joy for the payment of a fee. But there are other and more important definitions of architecture. I think it was um, the great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein who said, do you think philosophy is difficult? Think instead how difficult it is to be an architect. He had built a house for his sister and went through the whole process of making architecture. Then, of course, there was Goethe who said that architecture was frozen music. I don't know whether that makes uh, music more than architecture. But perhaps the most important and apt definition of architecture comes from Vitruvius. But we'll come back to that later. Now, a little bit about architects. You know, we belong to the first profession, the oldest profession, not the one you're thinking of, but the first born, Cain, was the first architect. Before him, they say that God, Allah, was the great architect. But Allah was modest. He didn't have the egoism of the architects. He built a garden. He didn't build a house for man. Man instead, in his arrogance, constantly builds houses for his gods, pagan gods, any type of gods, to any deity, because we know least about what matters most and we don't know where we're going. So we have this fear. Now, another definition of an architect comes from my own, a self-made man who worships his creator. It's the hysteria of the ego. And if you don't believe it, I'll tell you a little story about Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright was called up as a witness in a court case. And the judge said, Mr. Wright, I believe you are the world's greatest living architect. And Frank Lloyd Wright said, yes, Your Honor, I am. On his way back home, his wife said, but Frank, you can't really say these things in public, can you? He said, but my dear, I was under oath. I couldn't lie. So there you are. So, now, just in case, because, you know, we think too much of ourselves, there was an Australian architect who wrote a book and gave us the flip side of the importance of architects. He said, can you imagine that you are on a plane and the captain says, we have an emergency. Is there an architect on board? Now, I'm going to talk about the sun because both our countries, Malta and Jordan, have this wonderful asset of a burning sun. We also have the wonderful asset of belonging to the Mediterranean, where culture, history, architecture, art, whatever you want, the whole civilization of mankind was born. And the idea that somehow or other, this origin and influence of the Mediterranean is, is paramount. By the way, a lovely definition of architecture comes from Mark Twain's book, The Diary of Adam and Eve. When Eve first sees Adam, she thinks it's a reptile. But then at the end, she says, well, maybe I thought it could be architecture. Now, we'll talk a little bit about origins and influences. Where do we come from? What do we see? It was William Blake who said, we become what we behold. So for me, I was born and bred on the island of Malta. And Malta is in the center of the Mediterranean. 
midway between north and south and midway between east and west. And its architecture, as you can see here, is a typology which is, makes evident the geographical position of the island. The cube houses, which you see below, which come from the south, topped by the Baroque dome, which comes with the Knights of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem in the 16th century. Now, interestingly enough, we have also in our language, we have a language of Semitic origin, but written in the Roman alphabet. Malta has one, well had, because things have changed now, but one simple rock material stone, a limestone, which we use throughout history for the building over many, many millennia. Quentin Hughes, who was one of the great scholars of Maltese architecture, had said that Malta must be known to be understood and understood to be enjoyed. Many people came to Malta and left their mark. There is the story that the island of Goza was the island of uh, Ogigia and Calypso. Saint Paul, the saint, landed in Malta and converted the Maltese to Christianity. Caravaggio, Kershner, Cagliostro, anybody you know in history probably passed in Malta. Here again, we see the iconic, typical Maltese village with the church dominating. And then, of course, in the 16th century, the Knights of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem came to Malta and built the city of Valletta. And the city of Valletta is one of the most amazing city capitals in Europe. It was designed by the Italian architect and military engineer Francesco Laparelli. Laparelli was assistant to Michelangelo. And Michelangelo had, in fact, written in his will that once he passed away, he wanted the work on the dome of St. Peter's to be continued by Laparelli. Laparelli died before Michelangelo, so obviously this didn't take place. Laparelli came to Malta and wrote one of the most important items about how to build. He said, this is a city which is going to be under siege. It can be under siege for even a period of six months. So it needs two subterranean spaces. It needs a water system and it needs a cellar to store food. And then comes this wonderful phrase and from the rock which is cut to make these subterranean spaces, you can build the house above. That's the sort of thinking we should be going through today. Now, the most important remnants on the island of Malta are, of course, the Neolithic temples. And here we have a lesson to learn today. In those days, the land had more meaning. People had learned to husband the earth. They also realized that what, when they planted, when they gathered, and when they actually took any form of action on their produce, all this depended on the movement of the heavenly bodies. So most of the temples are in fact either orientated as calendars to mark the longest day, summer solstice, the winter solstices, and the others are nestled deep into the womb of Mother Earth. They also understood that in a way, time was not linear, but cyclic. They lived in peace for 2,500 years. And that is absolutely amazing. We're talking of a period of 3,000 years before Christ. They came to Malta 5,000 years before Christ from Sicily and 2,500 years before Christ, the civilization vanished. We don't know where they went to. We don't know why. But what we do know is that these people had a wisdom which somehow we seem to have lost. Einstein himself had said, where has all the wisdom gone lost in knowledge? And the ancients knew something which somehow we seem to have forgotten. So 
I was born in this island and obviously then this is what I assimilated. And as I said before, you become what you behold. But that is almost a visual amalgamation of what you assimilate. So you need mentors because you need a cerebral overlay to what you have assimilated in terms of aesthetics. And my first great master, of course, was Giuponti. I spent a year and a half working in his studio before this great cathedral of Taranto was built. But the wonderful thing about it was he introduced me to two most important things. One, he said, design first, measure later. Today, we have a tendency to measure first and then design. And the other thing he introduced me to is an even more affinity to the vernacular architecture. He was very friendly with Bernard Rudowski, who wrote the paramount book on vernacular architecture, architecture without architects. And you know, I ask all the students, please look at your vernacular architecture. They were built by amateurs, but you know, sometimes things done by amateurs are a little bit more successful than those done by professionals. The Ark, Noah's Ark, was built by amateurs. The Titanic was built by pro professionals, so watch it. It also happened to be that when I was in Italy, this was the golden age of Italian architecture. And great architects like Moretti, like Pierluigi Nervi, like Gioponti himself, like Michelucci, like Vittorio Vigano, Albini, Ernesto Rogers, all these were masters and they all came to the studio because they wanted to be published in Domus. As editor was Gioponti. So I met all these and somehow or other, they left something which I was able to assimilate. Five minutes with a mentor of that stature is worth hundreds of hours with anybody else. Then the second great master I had, I was very lucky that in the 60s, as a very young architect, so Basil Spence, who was architect of Coventry Cathedral and also the architect of the British Embassy in Rome, which is, which is the one you see here, came to Malta and settled here. And we became very close friends. He was a great delineator. He was a wonderful, wonderful person to know. And he arrived at the time when my father had passed away. And in a way, he became almost a surrogate father. And he also taught me about the importance of making a building. You see, architects on the whole make a process for other people to make a building. But to make a building with your own hands is something else. But I'll come to that because I had that experience later. Now. The third mentor was the British artist, Victor Passmore. Victor Passmore also came to Malta. He lived in Malta from the 1968 to 1998 when he died. We had a very, very close friendship. He was again a great, great mentor. And from him, I learned the elimination of the non-essential. The idea that when you finish a product and you finish an architectural project, let it stay a little bit, because at that stage, you're very subjective with it. You're too tied down, even with your own pleasure of the physical activity of having finished the drawings or the job or whatever it is. So then in time, you can look at it objectively and go through a process of the elimination of the non-essential. He also taught me about the harmony of opposites. We always had these long discussions on the Japanese aspect of yin and yang, things which to us appear as complete opposites, to them are a harmony of opposites. And I also learned from him the dialectics of form and space. A great and important artist, and the one thing I can say to students, remain eternal students. Remain, I am still an eternal student. I will be a student till the end of my days. So now 
we're going to look at the first works, early works. So, you know, if one is born and bred in a place, one assimilates the things. And to me, tradition is the alphabet. Bella Bartok had once said, what is new and significant must of necessity be grafted to old roots. Form is the language, but architecture above all must be a poem to touch your heart. So we go to the very early stages and this was a series of works which were actually labeled as regionalism. Now regionalism in the 60s was almost a counteraction to the modernist movement, which was rampant at the time. And there were only a few of us. They were probably amongst the most important, Rifat Chadirchi from Iraq, Faraoui and Demazieris from uh, Morocco, Serge Santelli, Yafar Dukan, of course, and Rasem Badran from your own country. And we were always published, Aris Constantinidis from Greece and Johan Kodek from Spain, that we were published with a little bit of a pinch of salt because we were opposing what was going on. So I have always believed that the, the most important thing in an architecture of regionalism is that you have a building which relates to place, but also relates to time. Memory is one of the most important things. Man is a mnemonic animal. Without our memory, we have no existence. And one of the things which I opposed was always the fact that Walter Gropius, when he founded the Bauhaus School, and by the way, I don't know how many of you know that he must have been really destined to found the Bauhaus School because he survived two bullets in his helmet in World War I, which didn't actually touch him. He lay for five hours with five dead corpses in a trench, and he survived an air crash with a dead pilot. So, and moreover, he married Alma Mahler, the uh, widow of the great composer, I don't know which was the most popular, Gustav Mahler. And he had said that modern architecture is a new tree with new roots, and all old trees have to be eliminated. What I was saying was, no, it is not necessary to have a completely new tree. Why not a new leaf? Why not a new branch? Why not something which creates a sense of continuity, fate and tradition, instead of arrogance and revolt? So those are the most, most important things for me. Now, Teatro dell'Architettura was actually a term which was founded by the Italian, the great Italian architect Paolo Portoghese, who was introduced to me by my friend Mario Pisani, for whom I also have great, great respect. And now what I was trying to do was this wonderful quote from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the little prince, it is useful because it is beautiful. And we tended to have lost this idea that we create things which are, which are beautiful, things which somehow or other need to give a sense of enrichment to the soul and the spirit. This is a um, Aquasan Lido, and here the search is to create what I would term pastoral Arcadias, as opposed to monetary dystopias. I try to recall that in the ancient days, architects were high priests, they were mint makers, they were magicians, and this is something which we tend to have lost. An architect today seems to be more a vehicle for speculators and money makers. You know, in one of the books, and at the end, for the benefit of the students, I'm going to give them 
a selection of books which I think are necessary because I firmly believe that after one's years as a student, you do not become an architect at the, after leaving the university. You should become a university graduate, which gives you a completely different mentality and a completely different point of view of life. One of the wonderful books, which I've always loved, was Paul Valéry's Eupalinos. And in Eupalinos, he says, there's a conversation which takes place in ancient Greece and Eupalino says there are three types of buildings. There are buildings which are mute, there are buildings which speak, and there are buildings which sing. My venture, I don't know if I succeed, is to try and create buildings which in fact sing. The Corbusier, many years later, centuries later, says you use stone, you use concrete, you use wood, and you build houses. That is construction. You touch my heart, that is architecture. So, you know, in a way we have to think of the architect now being an alchemist, an architect not involved solely in the speculative, consumerative society which we have created. And the other thing which is important is the absence of spaces, the spaces in between. You know, sometimes absence is more powerful than presence. Think of the Twin Towers in New York. Their absence is, in fact, even more present than the previous presence. I also tend to think of an architecture which evokes the literary tales, which I'm extremely fond of, by great authors, uh, Italo Calvino, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, Borges, the great Argentinian poet, author. He says something really wonderful, which is worth noting. He's, he was blind and he was once asked, but why do you travel if you're blind? There's, it is more important to feel a place than to see it. And that reminds us that we sense architecture not only visually, but more so by all our five senses. So we can smell architecture, we can touch architecture, we can see architecture, we can feel architecture, we can hear architecture. I remember smelling the baths by Peter Zumto in Switzerland. It was amazing. And you can hear architecture, walk into an old cathedral and hear the organ and hear the whole. So the, imp the important thing is here to refer to a book, which I consider one of the Bibles. Of architecture, which is the eyes of the skin by a very good friend of mine, Johanny Palasma. And he goes through these five senses and how the geography of the space relates to the geography of the mind. And in one particular sentence, he says, when I was at the Acropolis and close to the columns of the Parthenon, I had a great urge to taste the marble, which I think is one of the most immaculately beautiful things one can say about architecture. At the end of it all, you know, going back to a quote again from a book, The Little Prince, it is only with the heart that one can see correctly that which is imperative, is imp invisible to the eyes. So at the end, what is one trying to do? One is trying to create holidays for the spirit. It is about building homes for the soul spaces which lift the heart. At the end of it all, you know, one of the great architects, Alvar Aalto, had said that the wish of the architect is to create, at the end of it all, a paradise on earth. And Lou Kahn, who again, I urge students to see both his work and read his books, 
this is the extension to what you've seen just before, uh, had said that joy is the key word. Now in terms of sacred spaces. Axel Monte had said that the soul needs more space than the body. And how true that is. Now when one is working on sacred spaces, one remembers Antonio Gaudi's quote. He says the most difficult job for the architect remains that of building a church. And how right he was. Why? Because you are measuring against the absolute immeasurable. And that is not an easy task. So, and so this was my first work. I was 24 years of age. I had just come back from my period of work in Italy at the Polytechnic and in the studio of Gio Ponti. And my father, who was an architect, I said, I'm going to give you a present because you've done well there. I'm not going to give you money. And I'm not going to give you an object. But two weeks ago, I got a commission for a church for a little village in the north part of the island of Malta, Manicata. And he gave me this. It created, uh, unfortunately, he never saw it completed because he passed away before its completion. You can see where the origins come. I mean, the tool sheds. But it's about a church of its place and a church of its time. What it gave me was an extraordinary experience. It was built by the voluntary labor of the villagers themselves who couldn't read. So when I took up the plans, the first thing they said, well, we're terribly sorry, but we're an illiterate lot here. We can't read plans. And of course, that to me was a tremendous shock, but it turned out to be one of the most beautiful experiences of my life because I was making a building with my hands. I was choosing the stones. I was actually, it was almost the medieval master mason building a cathedral. And I've always said to my students that once in their lifetime, they should make a building with their hands. We've got something on the screen here. And we're stuck. This is okay. Okay, this is where, this is where we have. Okay, thank you. Nice, thanks for your help. This is the interior of the church, and the um, local stone. This was a monastery next to it. Now you see, the sacred buildings throughout the ages have always reflected the way man understood his deity, the gods of his time. The Neolithic temples of Malta believed, the users believed that the deity was a deity of the earth, which provided them with food. Later, they were the great gods of Egypt, the great gods of Greece, of Rome, and the Catholic, Muslim, and Jewish believers in the same monotheistic religion and monotheistic faith. So each one of those periods produced buildings to reflect man's respect to the deity. Now, one of the things which always amazed me is I actually designed, I think, 25 sacred spaces. But throughout my career, nobody ever, when I was building a house, ever asked me to design a space for the spirit, a space for meditation, a space for solace and peace. Everybody knew where his television had to go. Everybody knew where his collection of books or records, the dimensions for the kitchen, where the dining room and the living room specifications were laid out. And not once did anybody come along and say, I want the space for the soul, space for the spirit. This is the space which I designed for our own home, a little meditative chapel. You know, the interesting thing in designing a sacred space, perhaps more important than the sacred space itself, is the threshold between the secular or profane space and the sacred space. 
you need time to reflect before you cross into the sacred. And all religions have this, places of ablution, places of thinking, places of meditation. The important thing is how you cross over from the reality of the secular world to the extensive spirituality of, and sacrality of what lies within. Hence, you see in this photograph, uh, some stones on the floor. So as you cross over into the sacred carpet in the center, you are actually aware that you are changing from one thing to another. Another thing which is, I think, extremely important to me is I certainly believe that when you design a sacred space, you impart into it a certain amount of love. And you can distinguish a building which is done with love as opposed to a building which is done purely for speculative and monetary purposes. I also have this theory that that love, that energy, is actually absorbed by the materials themselves and is then radiated back to the users. And you can feel this, most of all, in monasteries. The monasteries are designed with love and the silence and the solace there and the atmosphere, I think this wonderful word, atmosphere. You know, Jonas Salk, who discovered the vaccine for polio, had struggled for many, many a year to try and find the solution. He eventually almost gave up and decided to go for a five-week session in a monastery in Assisi. And the solace and peace of his little monastic room, he found the solution and came out with the antidote. So we're looking at spaces which need to be silent. And silence is probably one of the most difficult things to attain in this world of everything, buses, mobiles, cars, everything has noise. We are surrounded by noise. And I think the greatest culprit or our anxiety is in fact the great noise. I remember I had the occasion of meeting John Cage, the composer who wrote this uh, great piece, 433, which of course was a non-performance and the pianist sat at the, at the piano and waited for four minutes and 33 seconds. And when I met um, John Cage at an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, an exhibition by Jasper Johns, and I had the occasion to speak to him. And I said, of course, your piece is about silence. He said, no, my piece is about the negation of silence because silence does not exist. He said, the music is not there, but the ambient noise is there. He said, in fact, that he had gone into an anechoic chamber to actually experience pure silence. But the only sound he heard was the sound he said he could not eliminate, which was the sound of his own heartbeat. And so to try and attain silence in architecture is not by any means an easy task. So on we go to the fact that at the end of it all, what we're trying to do is to create spaces which somehow or other enrich the spirit and enrich the soul. You know we, know, we know so much about life. We know how, we know why, we know how, why. We don't really know why. We don't know why we're here. We don't, that's something which we're never ever going to find out till our demise. This is a large scale church, which always makes it the most difficult. And, you know, I would like to think that the making of a sacred space is a kind of bridge to a spiritual experience. C.S. Lewis had a wonderful phrase, but I'll change it slightly. He said, while others were building ships in their bottles, I was building a lighthouse. Well, I would say I was attempting to build a lighthouse. This is a church which I did for the southern Italy 
in a competition, which we didn't win. And it's a much simpler, it's now going to an architecture of the elimination of the non-essential. This is a project which I had proposed when the uh, city of Valletta was the capital culture city of Europe. One of the things which has always worried me is that in the religious aspect of the three monotheistic faiths, there's always been strife. It's quite extraordinary that the word religion comes from the Latin word relegare, which means to bind together. And all we have are wars. So I said, why don't we try as a legacy to remind us that Malta and the city of Valletta was the capital culture city two years ago? Why don't we build a mosque, a synagogue, and a Christian chapel and put them together? and have a central space where they can meet. They weren't going to unite the three monotheistic faiths, but what they would have done was at least to have them have a hand of friendship between them. This was a biblical garden, and this was a chapel, the Chapel of the Rainbow. There were seven chapels with the different colors of the and this was an arcade of fate, which was supposed to be built in Barcelona, but nothing happened. Another church again. And this was a chapel for, there's an island of the Neolithic temples of Hajarim and in Nidra, which must have been a sacred altar. And I thought at the millennium, it would be a wonderful idea to dig into the cliff and put a cross. So you're Christianizing a, a pagan altar, because after all, the millennium was a Christian faith, not uh, an event which we were all scared for because of computer failouts. This is what it would have looked like on the sea. And this was the pavilion I designed when the Pope visited Malta. Now we're going to talk about mnemonic layering. Mnemonic layering, as I said, you know, memory is the most important thing. And to know a place, one must know its memories. This is the University of Malta, for which I designed the extension. And here, to me, what was more important was the space between the buildings. The, uh, it's, uh, again, it's about the silence. It was, uh, for example, Debussy, the great composer, said it is the silence which makes the music. And Arthur Schnabel, the great pianist, was once asked, what makes you the world's greatest pianist? He said, well, the notes I play like anybody else, but the silence is in between, and that's where the secret lies. So the important thing is about scale, about context, about mnemonic remembrances, and then we come to the great city of Valletta, the capital city of Malta. And I had a number of projects, which the entrance to Valletta, which never actually took place. And the, this is the Central Bank of Malta. And the Central Bank of Malta was particularly important to me because it was a building in the fortifications. And I had to make sure that it wasn't visible over the line of the fortifications. So here, what we're talking about is that, in a way, while there is a time to be bold in architecture, there more often is a time to be humble. The architect is not only the designer of the future, he must also function as the defender of the past. So what's happening here is that there is a time, as I said before, to be bold, but there is a time to be humble. Perhaps it is better to sing in the chorus than to utter a great high note, as a Pavarotti would do. Then I had this project of the um, rehabilitation of an old fortress, which was designed specifically to keep people out. And I had to transpose it into a center for creativity. You can see the three layers here. The first layer at the top is as it was built by the Knights of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. Then there was a British intervention and they 
put in water systems, and then was my intervention. And this is what it more or less looks like. Again, it's a question of, in a way, doctoring the old, and then what I put in were a series of what I would call installations, not necessarily anything which touched the old walls. So what you had was that as you walked through the building, you were able to read the three phases, the phase one, which was the Knights of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, phase two, which was the British occupation, and phase three, which was my own interventions. So in a way, architecture is no longer a noun, but becomes a verb, because the narrative of a building is one of the most important things. And, you know, so in a way, one listens to the wisdom of the old stones in that case. And I learned this from Italian masters of the 60s. Carlo Scarpa, of course, was the supreme master of mixing the old and the new in his buildings in Verona, in Palermo, and various other places. Uh, Franco Albini, and also in museums, and Ernesto Rogers, all these Italian architects. Isn't it one of the wonderful things, another thing for students, this is an aside, go to Italy, because in Italy, one of the extraordinary things is the presence of the past. Unlike any other country where the past is enclosed in museums, walk the streets of Florence and touch Brunelleschi, touch Giotto, touch Ghiberti's gates. But they're there on the street, they're part and parcel of everyday life. And this is what you assimilate, this is what you learn. This was a building which I had proposed as a parliament for using the old 16th century windows and doorways, but instead of on a wall which was made of stone, it now was also a glass wall, which also gave a sense of transparency, again, which it didn't happen. Now, architects who draw. This is dedicated to Kamal who introduced me to this wonderful place. And the important thing is, you know, the eye in the hand. And I here make a solemn wish for students and young architects, do not let the mouse kill the pencil. The bridge between mind and paper is still best crossed by the hand. Use your pencil like a sword and keep drawing. The most beautiful thing about drawing, you know, one of the things I used to play with my grandchildren, I used to say, please draw me that wall. And the obvious answer would be, but how can I put that big wall on a small piece of paper? So then comes the transposition from real scale to paper scale. And if you learn to do that, and that's why it's important to do field drawings, you will then start understanding the relationship of what you do as an architect, which is the absolute reverse, where in fact you translate paper scale into real scale. So, you know, I think in a way, I think, I think with my hands. And one of the most important thing is the seeing eye to be able to, because you don't draw everything you see, because that would be impossible. You don't draw every stone. So again, what you do is you assimilate the whole building or the whole element that you're seeing. Then you go through what Victor Pasmo had taught me, the elimination of the non-essential. And then what you draw is the essence, the spirit of the place. So these are various drawings. And this was a crazy period when I was doing the Topoli. There's a book which has just been published in Italy called Metropoli and Metopoli. And um, I recently had my cataract done and my ophthalmologist, uh, when I asked him, why do you think I need a cataract? He said, well, look at the drawings you've been doing and you'll find out. <laughs> um, so now a little bit about architecture and education. You know, architecture, let me tell you, to me is not a profession, it's a vocation. I'm therefore not exactly sure whether you can teach architecture, but you can learn architecture. One of the problems with architecture schools 
is the lack of contact with the reality of making a building. You know, many students go through five, six years of a university course and have never met a client, have never met the planning people. And at the end, you know, when they come out into the real world, it's a little bit of a shock. So I would like to see more of the practical aspect of the reality of making architecture when you are in the process of, this was a project for a town in England, it was called Up and Down. So what went up also went down. And these were a sculpture I did for the President's Garden at a time when we were sending immigrants back. And I said, look, these are immigrants who have come. And not only did we not send them back, but we colored them and we put them in the presidential palace. This was a Dracula uh, sculpture in Romania, which, uh, you know, and this is love. Love to remind us that at the end, love cures where there is love all is calm. So at the end, I would like to say, you know, that we have to, as architects, design spaces which not only provide functional and materialistic requirements and solutions, but which at the end lift us emotionally. As I said, we need, unfortunately, to think very, very importantly about our planet. We have done our planet in. It is true we live in an age of celebration, but we live in an age of tremendous loss. I think it is. So we have to learn that architecture must be a palliative for a fast fading planet. We must think globally, but I still believe that we must act locally. For me, the most important quote remains that of a great poet of mine, who I love, Tennessee Williams. I don't want reality, I want magic. And again, Borges, the great Argentinian writer, my business is to weave dreams. Shukra. I will uh, you want to, if we do a little bit about the books and the things to read. Yes. Okay. Okay. We are back. So, uh, is that? Yes. Now, if anyone wants to ask some questions, and also there are a few recommendations from uh, Richard England about books and uh, other um, architects in Malta, international no, 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 no. architects, we can go through this. Um, we can start with the questions, maybe? Yeah, sure. Maybe these are the books I want to. Or the recommendations, what yes, do you sir. prefer? Look, let me let me give let me give some. These are basically for the for the, for the students, the architects. I'm going to make a list. Architects who I absolutely adore. I mean, Luis Barragan, the great Mexican architect, who Carmel mentioned before. Carlos Carpa, Daniel Lieberskin for taking architecture to its absolute limits. You know, architects who draw. Amel Mahedin first. Mm -hmm. I also suggest that students look at the drawings of Paul Rudolph, the American architect who did all those linear drawings from the 60s of which my generation was completely influenced by. Alvaro Cesar, who also draws beautifully. Antoine Pridoc. And by the way, don't forget Piranesi, who knew something about drawing. Music. I think music is extremely important, and I would suggest you listen to the music of Avropart, Goreski, the Greek composer, film music composer, Eleni Kalandrui, absolutely amazing, Stephen Mikas. Places to visit, what can I tell you, Petra, 
the number one. Il Preto in Sicily, which is the uh, sort of monument to the fallen Gibellina by Alberto Burri. Pentadattilo, also a lovely abandoned village in Reggio Calabria. Der el Bahri, the tomb of Hatshepsut by Senamut, one of the great architects of the ancient world, and the Neolithic temples of Malta. Um, I think, you know, some books to read. The Bible of Modern Architecture by William Curtis. Architecture, modern architecture since 1900, essential. Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. If on a Winter's Tale by Italo Calvino. The Eyes of the Skin, which I mentioned before. The Poetics of Space by Gaston Bacalar. Experiencing Architecture, Bramson. Astonishing the Gods by Ben Oakley. Please read this. It's one of the most beautifully written, scripted descriptions of cities and spaces. Absolutely amazing. Amante l'architettura by Gioponti, Love Architecture. There's an English translation. The famous Fountainhead by Amy Rand. And The Architecture of Happiness, Elaine de Botton. Although a lot of architects hate the book. Chambers of Memory Palace, Charles Moore, wonderful. And back to Bernard Rudofsky and Architecture Without Artists. And then some other books which are not necessarily more on the almost fantasy on the, the child within me comes out. The Diary of Adam and Eve, which I mentioned by Mark Twain. The Phantom Tollboat by Norton Jaster, who incidentally was an architect. The Little Prince, which remains one of the greatest classics. The Happy Prince by Oscar Wilde. And anything, any book, any poem by Jorge Luis Borges. Pablo Neruda, the most wonderful poems, well worth reading. John Hyduk, who was an architect who wrote these extraordinary poems, and Jacques Prévert. And at the end, Bob Kaufman, who was one of the beat artists of the 60s, who wrote these wonderful one-liners and said, you know, when you read all those thick, fat books about God, please remember they were all written by men. And then his, possibly the one which I find most pertinent is, I went to a masquerade party disguised as myself, none of my friends recognized me. It's about the masks we wear in life. Those are some recommendations, purely personal. Okay, so shall we go on with the questions? I would like to ask uh, everyone here, please, uh, to, if you have any question, please raise your hand. Then we can all answer all the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Hope so. <laughs> I raise my hand if nobody is having any questions. Go on, I... sir. Yes, go on, professor. Okay. Well, uh, Richard, thank you. Enlightening lecture, as always, thrilled with that. Uh, we go back to architectural education. You have been practicing, and you've been teaching, and you've been lecturing. And we have witnessed in third world countries that most of architects, most of academicians actually, have little or no practice. And that leads in third world countries, to a catastrophic outcome that our students graduates with little knowledge of practice because our teachers and academicians lack expertise in public practice and professional uh, achievements. And that reflects on the quality of the students and the grads that we have. I'd like to get your opinion about it. 
Yes, because unfortunately then what happens, it's a big leap between the theoretical aspects which they have been taught and the practical reality of making a building. You know, I was once having dinner with Helmut Jahn, the American architect, and he said, you know, to draw a building is the easiest thing, and he draws beautifully. And he said, but to put up a building is like fighting a war. And it is like fighting a war, because there are all the aspects. There's the client who wants to cut down on the money. There's the planning people who don't really understand too much about architecture, I regret to say. There's the actual effect of living on site, of understanding the materials you're using. So the point you make is absolutely valid, and I've always tried to say, but unfortunately what happens is that you get a theoretical aspect and very little practical aspect out in the field. They need to be able to go out, meet a client. When I, the reason I resigned from the, uh, my deanship at the university was exactly that, because I had proposed that I wanted to bring part of my studio into the university course. So in order that the students in the five years of their course would have initially met a client, and the first with the permission of the client, obviously, had met the client at the, our first meeting between architect and client, and to go through the whole process, and at least in the process of four or five years, they have seen a building born in the blank piece of paper, in the brief provided by the client, and then the process of design, from sketches to drawing, and then more important, the making of the building on site. Because as I said before, the architect does not make the building, the architect makes a language. The architect creates a language for other people to be able to use that language and translate it into the manifest building. So it's a very complex reality which students need to be very well made aware of. Thanks for your point, Kamal. Thank you, sir. We have is one to ask the question. Yeah. Thank you, sir, yeah. for this uh, great lecture. Really, uh, I cannot summarize what I learned from this lecture, but I would like to know uh, what is your uh, impression or what's your evaluation of Petra as something in Jordan that and in terms of architecture, in terms of design, what is the unique thing about uh, Petra architecture, in your opinion? Well, first of all, the extraordinary thing is that it's not built, but it's actually carved out of the, and it's also built from, from the top to the bottom, as opposed to the normal way we build. So that's one of the most interesting things. Now, what I would say to young architects in Jordan is, Remember your tradition, remember your memories, remember, learn from the vernacular, because architecture, although, as I said, architects must think globally, but act locally. I believe architecture must belong to a place. There are certain places which didn't have memories. Some of the large new cities in the Middle East never had a memory 70, 80 years ago. People were nomads and the place was a desert. But you have a strong traditional overlay, which must not be forgotten. You know, the mnemonic residue is one of the most important assets and pillars on which we can build a new architecture of its place, of its time, but it does not forget the mnemonic residues of the past. Next question. There is a question. There is a question on the mask. And yes, and let's plan to wrap up after this. Uh, maybe, maybe we can also finish in uh, around seven minutes. Yeah, I will read the question in the box. Okay. okay. So it's for, uh, for Ferruccio. Uh, he says. 
Can some, uh, as you mentioned, the music, can you please speak about your relation with the bel canto and its influence on your life as your architecture can be also read under the light of it? Sorry, could you repeat that, uh, Yasan? I, I missed the piece out. Sure. As you mentioned, music, can you please speak about your relation with the bel canto? And its influence. Yeah, bel canto. Oh. Yeah. And its influence on your life as your architecture can be also read under the light of it. You've hit the nail on the head. My alter ego, I wanted to become I wanted to be a tenor. I didn't want to be an architect, I wanted to be an operatic tenor. And the alter ego is that I collect tenor voices on record. 12,000 records of every tenor practically who made a noise on record. So music is very much part of my part of my life. And apart, but when I'm working, I cannot listen to the great pieces of music. I cannot listen to Mahler. I cannot listen to Bach. I cannot listen to Beethoven because they demand 100% of my attention. So I use what I would call background music, which is there, but not music, which is, I mean, Bach, probably the most architectural of all the composers. Mahler, listen to the Fifth Symphony. Listen to Goreski's Third Symphony. Um, Avro Part, if you ever want to hear the elimination of the non-essential. Avro Part made this wonderful statement. He said, I have now in my old age discovered that one note played beautifully is enough. And this one wonderful piece of music I recommend to you all is called Alina, A-L-I-N-A. -A. Absolute minimalism. The silences are almost more important than the sounds, but it's the most incredible piece of music. So there's so many composers, you know, so many, and music is an essential part of my life. It's an essential part of my life on the operatic side, where I, as I said, you know, I, I write about ten of ten of them, I write about, I mean, I was, I was, a, I was a product all this time from my grandmother. My mother, my mother died when I was born, and I was brought up by my grandmother. My grandmother was a Victorian strict woman, and she had this collection of Caruso records. And she would explain to me, and somehow my dear wife Miriam says I suffer from a disease called tenoritis. So, uh, but and then of course there were the Mario Lanza films, and gradually, you know, it became an addiction. When I was in Milan, I actually went went to to have singing lessons with a very famous Italian baritone. He said that my voice was okay, but uh, but unable to sing in tune, much to my displeasure. Fida, Doctor Fida. Thank you, Professor uh, Kamel. Uh, I would like to thank uh, architect. Uh, uh, the architect for his amazing uh, record and I have a small question if you can summarize in few points to us um, how to translate music into architecture um, you said music affected uh, your thinking your uh, ways of designing uh, and I was wondering if you can uh, summarize in few points how to translate this into uh, spaces, into uh, architecture? Thank Music you. is about sound and silence. Poetry is about sound and silence and how we sculpt one into the other. Architecture is about solid and void. So the difference is not exactly too far away. We're, you're building. You're building with different materials, but the structural system is still.
quite relatively akin to each other. I mean, I consider the right, I write poetry for my sins, but, uh, but it's also about building with words. And sometimes the silences are more important than the sound. In architecture, it is the spaces, which in fact are more important than the, the actual building itself, because that is what is, makes a, a building mood manipulative. But music is mood manipulative. Architecture is mood manipulative. Poetry is mood manipulative. And it's all about this balance between either sound and silence. Um, Bob Kaufman, to quote again, it says, the, uh, drum, the silent beat makes the drum beat. And it's the same in architecture. It's the space within which makes or moves you and emotionally or otherwise. Alain de Baton says one wonderful thing about architecture. It says, a, a good piece of architecture can make your life beautiful. A bad piece of architecture can ruin it. So we have a big responsibility. Architects have a big, big responsibility. We shape our buildings, but thereafter they shape us and they shape those who use them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Shukran. Shukran. Salam. So I, I, we are done by now. Thank you. Uh, let's give the mic to Dr. Kamel again. Well, again, thank you, Fida, yes. for hosting. Dr. Yasser, the chairman of the department, with us. He has been with us all day, uh, I mean, for the lecture. All the audience, thank you. Most importantly, Richard, always, I am thrilled. I tried to be on your follow steps, follow your steps, and Jafar and Rasim. I just one small note. I did sketch and color during your lecture some of what you have said and some of the pictures uh -huh. and i will scan them and send them to you this is how i teach architecture by my hand and my soul that you have helped me doing that to all my students whom i always proud that they are my best teachers because i walked into the class and i get 50 ideas i give them three richard england your name proceeds you are a legacy in architecture, as there are some beautiful architects all over the world. Roberto Bermarx, a landscape architect, he paints the landscapes. Louis Barragan, Richard England. And the story goes on and goes on and goes on. I would like to ask a small favor. With all due respect to Fida and Yasser, my colleagues, I would like you to join us in one of the upcoming juries whenever your time, Mace, allows that we'll listen and see the students. You uh, inspire people to be leaders. And I was lucky at one time to be a parishioner. But I will tell you something. You and Sadi Kartunic and James Turner and Jafar Tokan and Rasim have enriched my life so much. And I tried to dispatch that to my students. Each one of us has a skill. Fida, thank you. I'd like to thank the American University of Madaba, Mace for a wonderful job with Yezen. You drove me nuts, Yezen, especially over the <laughs> week. But when I heard that Richardism comes up, please guys, anybody who can travel to Malta, Richard is a wonderful host. Yes, it's good you. to spend two hours with him. Thank you all. God bless. Best regards to your family, Miriam, and the boys. And by the way, one of Richard's, I think, sons is a beautiful painter, if I'm not mistaken. And it runs in the family. He just doesn't want them to be artists or painters and architects. But they always say, if you rub your shoulder with a good man or a good woman, you always would lead. Fida, when you see, do, see students like you and Mace and Ihab and Leon Hamash and some of the people that I have taught and Farsi Zaru and 
Zahir and Ismail and Sakhar Dodin, when there is goes on and goes on and goes on, I feel so thrilled that some of them have met Richard, listened to Richard, and dashed into his room and space. God bless. God bless the humanity. Thank you, sir. Kamel, God bless you. Master I love you. you. That's Thank all. You. I love you. That's <laughs> it. No <laughs> more. No more. Ciao, Ciao. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So much. Thanks. Thanks. So. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Good evening. Shukran. Okay. Shukran. يعطيك العافية دكتور كامل يعطيك العافية يزن يعطيك العافية ياسر كيرمان اوف ذا ديبارتمنت ات واز وندرفول وندرفول ايفنت يا كامل وانت ما شاء الله حضورك كان انا بالنسبة لي نفس أهمية حضور ريتشارد ف حبيبي الله يحماك الله يحماك الله يحماكم الله يحماكم يعطيكم العافية دكتور يعني شكرا ايسا ابدعتي يزن ثانكس فور اول ذا جروب Everybody who watched us, we are so thrilled. Thank you, Doctor Kamel. Thank you, Prof Kamel. Thank you. Thank you anytime. It's a my pleasure. Actually, you should thank Mais and Yazan. I just thank you, Mais and Yazan. 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 Thank you, Mais and Y